Good morning and welcome from St. John's Westminster Union Church. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God declares, I am who I am. The God of our ancestors is with us today. God is our God from generation to generation. Let us worship God on this holy ground. Please join with me in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we have gathered with you today to hear your word for us. We marvel at the witness of Moses who received your call to liberate your enslaved people. Be with each of us this day, guiding our spirits and opening our hearts to hear your forgiveness and to call us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament. I will be reading from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15 from the New Revised Standard Version. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the reading of the Word of God. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said. And Moses said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I also seen I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, 
If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the word. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing unto you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. There's an old story of a very long evening. The search committee for a new pastor had been going over profile after profile in hopes of finding their perfect minister. Tired of the whole process, they were about ready to call it quits for the night when they came upon this letter of introduction from a potential candidate. To the pulpit nominating committee, you can tell they're Presbyterians. It is my understanding that you are in the process of searching for a new pastor, and I would like to apply for the position. I wish I could say that I'm a terrific preacher, but I can't. Actually, I stutter when I speak. I wish I could say that I have an impressive educational background, but I can't. No college or seminary, just the school of hard knocks. I wish I could say I bring a wealth of experience to the job, but I can't. I have never been a pastor before. I wish I could say I have wonderful pastoral skills, but I can't. Sometimes I lose my temper and I have been known to get violent when upset. Once I even killed somebody, but gracious folks that you are, I am certain that you will not hold that against me. I know churches these days want young ministers to attract younger members, and I wish I could say that I'm young, but again, I can't. Actually, I'm almost 80, but I still feel young. With all that which might go against me, why am I applying for your position? It's simple. One afternoon recently, the voice of God spoke to me and said that I had been chosen to lead. I admit I was a bit reluctant at first, but here I am. I look forward to hearing from you and to leading you into an exciting new future. The pulpit nominating committee looked at one another. The chairperson asked, well, what do you think? The rest of the committee was aghast. A stuttering, uneducated, inexperienced, arrogant, old, obviously neurotic, ex-murderer for a pastor? Somebody's got to be crazy. The chairperson eyed them all around before she added, and it signed, Sincerely, Moses. The Moses saga is one of the most familiar in all of scripture. From our earliest Sunday school days, we remember Moses was first introduced to us as a helpless baby floating in the Nile. Because of the rapid increase of population of the Israelites, the Egyptian pharaoh decided to slaughter all Hebrew boys. After being placed in the basket and put onto the Nile, Moses was spotted by the pharaoh's daughter, who took pity on him and drew him out of the river, living his life as a prince of, in Egypt. One day, Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. Moses immediately killed him, and the next day, out of fear, ran into the wilderness. There he encountered seven women by the well who were being bullied by shepherds. Moses not only drew water for them, but also watered the flock. 
Jethro, the father of the seven young women, was very impressed and welcomed Moses into the family. Moses went from prince of Egypt to herding sheep in Midian. But God had more plans for him. Now we come to this unusual story that is the focus of this morning's Old Testament lesson. The burning bush, a symbol adopted by Christians around the world to show how God can and does turn the ordinary into the extraordinary and the transforming power that comes when the natural meets supernatural. The bush was probably just an ordinary bramble bush, the most usual kind of vegetation in those parts in those days. The fire would not have been that remarkable because spontaneous combustion is not unheard of in a dry, hot desert country. But a fire that burns and does not consume? Hmm. So Moses went over to investigate. Suddenly, he heard his name coming from the bush. Moses leaned in, cocked his head to one side in wonder, and said, uh, Here I am. He heard his voice again. Come no closer. Remove those sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Uh-huh. Moses looked as bewildered as you or I might be, fumbled around with, with the straps on his sandals, removed them, then looked quizzically at the bush again. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, he heard from the bush. Right. Right. This is one of those passages that comedians could have a field day with. The bush speaks, it's the voice of God. Right. Am I on candid camera or punked or something? Moses responded by shielding his face because he knew that to look at God was to die. God then said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, this is all good and well, but the present problem was God's choice of a leader. This 80-year-old shepherd, whose only entry to the corridors of Egyptian power would be through a justice system that only knows him as a fugitive from a murder charge. I think we can all agree that God's choices are not always easily explainable, are they? But it is important to note that God never defends his decisions, never explains why he chooses who he chooses. In answer to Moses' who am I objection, the response to Moses was simply, I will be with you. Moses was right. Who was he? But that didn't matter. The only thing that did matter was, I will be with you. We all want a sign of God's involvement in our lives, don't we? Just show me a sign, we say. Well, I love the sign that God promises to Moses. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. In other words, the only sign 
that he will get is in the rear view mirror. It's all hindsight. In other words, one day when you're back here on this mountain, Moses, and worshiping with your Hebrew brothers and sisters, you will look back at this moment in time and realize that God was with you all along, just as promised. I will be with you. That's your sign. As Moses followed, did what God commanded, spoke for God, and showed people the heart of God, the heart of Moses repeatedly broke and burned, and never, at least never in this life, knew the relief of a job finished, of a people completely righteous, of justice fully lived, of neighbors entirely loved, of commandments totally kept, obedience utterly given, or beloved community once and for all realized. So yes, Moses first came to see the bush, curious about this great sight, but by the end of his life, maybe he better understood that to follow God is to also no heartbreak, and to feel as if one has been burned. It means having to commit to a lot of things to the flames, letting what is worthless, unholy, or unwholesome be incarcerated, incinerated. It means being tried and purified and refined as if by fire, it means letting oneself be aglow with God's spirit, being rekindled and rekindled and rekindled and rekindled, which frankly is allowing oneself to be put into the flame and caught on fire over and over and over and over and over and over again. Jesus called it picking up your cross and following him. We just call it hard. Maybe Moses had an inkling of this, though, because as soon as this burning of fire, a flaming God, tells Moses where Moses comes into the plan, Moses started firing off excuses for in a rapid succession. We only heard the first two in today's reading, but you can easily go into Exodus and find them, the other two. I'm not enough. I don't know enough. People won't believe me or listen to me. I'm not good enough speaker. And Moses finally tops them all off by saying, send someone else, which is basically the same as, because I just don't want to. But God sticks with Moses. God doesn't say, you're right, Moses, you're not qualified, and you don't even want the job. What was I thinking? Put your shoes back on. Get out of here. Next. No. Rather, this burning love God says, go. This won't be easy on you, on me either. This is going to hurt both of us a lot. But this is the nature of love, not to give up to listen to the cry of the people, to do what needs to be done to set people free, to show them again and again what a holy, obedient life lived in love of God and neighbor looks like. So let's do this together. God didn't accept Moses' excuses because God never gives up, and God's burning love never goes out. By the end of his encounter with the burning bush, Moses would go and would feel his own heart singed, seared, and scarred, because God's burning love is not an easy thing, a weak or dull thing to carry. 
And although a blazing fire can be awesome, it's also more terrifying than majestic and more fearful than glorious. Jill Briscoe wrote a book with a, the, with a telling title, Here I Am, Send Aaron. Today, we can spout off excuses just as well as Moses. We might say, send my pastor, send an elder, or my spouse, or my neighbor, or my child, or my uncle, or my cousin. Send anybody else, but just don't send me. We can doubt it and question it till the cows come home. But my beloved, you are standing on holy ground. So watch out. The bush is still burning. Listen for that voice. It is speaking to you. So no more excuses. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we enter our time of prayer, I ask that you remember all of those prayer, prayer concerns that have been shared this week. We certainly remember all of those who are experiencing loss, and we keep in prayer all those who are ill, who are in pain, who are suffering, and all of those who are recovering from coronavirus or illness or surgery. We pray for those who are affected by Hurricane Laura this week, and we pray for them during the ongoing recovery in the weeks ahead. And we pray yet again for a spirit of peace and reconciliation upon our country and upon our whole world following the shooting of Jacob Blake earlier this week. Please continue to pray for all of the members of our church family who are on our prayer list as well as all of our sister congregations and ministries. Please join me as we lift all of our prayers, both spoken and unspoken to God, saying, Lord, hear our prayers. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you this day. We have followed many paths, and the one of hope unites us, although we admit that we love the drama of the burning bush. Here is the quaking Moses telling you that you have made a mistake. Moses does not believe that he can perform the task to which you have called him, but you know better. You will provide the support structure for this awesome task. We are just like Moses. We tell you that we have made a mistake, that we are not able or worthy to undertake the task of hope and peace for this world. We mumble about responsibilities and commitments, but you chide us to be in service by helping others, giving us the strength, the tools, the support that we need. Now it is our turn to respond to your call with a fervent yes, trusting in your presence and guidance. 
Help us to go forth and serve joyfully and confident in your world. God of hope, enter our hearts this day as we share our joys and concerns in prayer and in the actions and service that follows. As we lift before you situations and people who are in need of your healing mercies and your peace, help us to be to those who would, be, who would bring this peace to them. Give us strength and empower us for the ministries of reconciliation. For it is in your name that we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God promised to be with Moses, and we are here to witness the fulfillment of that promise. From generation to generation, the God of Israel is also your God. The God of the burning bush is waiting even now to encounter you to call you, to challenge you, and to change you. Go out to be sustained and surprised by the love of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Nearer my God to thee, is one of the more well-known hymns by Lowell Mason. I particularly like the words of the second verse. When, like the wanderer, the sun gone down, darkness be over me, my rest a stone, then in my dreams I'd be nearer, my God, to thee. Words by Sarah F. Adams. <laughs>